Hello everyone, my name is Mike Maniscalco with Ahiji. Today's webinar is part of our Networking Essentials webinar. We'll be talking about basic networking for technicians. Uh, today's webinar is primarily focused on uh, basic networking topics for residential integrators who are doing home networks. And this is meant for uh, techs who are just getting an introduction to networking for people who want to refresh around the basics. Uh, but it's part of our three series where we have a basic and intermediate and advanced seminars. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. If you haven't heard of Ahiji, Ahiji is a remote network management tool. Uh, we help you manage your networks more efficiently. We were established in 2009. We've won a number of, uh, of awards over those years. And we've also been the CE Pro brand leader for remote managed uh, network services over the past few years. Um, hopefully you've read about us in the press uh, and seen us at the trade shows. And by the end of this webinar, I kind of want to talk about what we're going to learn about today. But in this webinar, you should understand basic network devices. So we'll talk a little bit about what types of devices you should be installing. Um, you should be able to describe the IP addresses, subnets, gateways, DNS. We'll talk about how you can do basic network troubleshooting and how you can resolve your most common issues. We'll look at different ways of doing remote access and support. Understand some best practices, mainly around residential and small business networks. And then I'll talk a little bit about where you can continue to learn and where you can find additional education. Uh, lastly, we'll talk about why it's important to own your networks, own your, own your networks in the home going forward, and the trends that are affecting our industry. Now, before we get started, I do want to say that these webinars, we try very, very um, hard to keep these educational. You know, we don't want this to be an IHEGI commercial, so if you're not familiar with IHEGI, we will talk a little bit about IHEG, how IHEG helps you through some of your networking problems. I'll give you an introduction to IHEG just enough that you know what we do, but we're not going to get into a demo. This isn't in any way a sales pitch. Um, so if you do want a demo, I would encourage you to go to IHEG.com. You can schedule a demo there, and we'll do a one-on-one -on -one demo at your uh, convenience. So just go to IHEG.com and schedule a demo if you're not familiar with it. I will say that at the end of this webinar, if there are a handful of you who do want a quick demo, I will reserve some time. It will be past the hour, so I know a lot of you have to go. Um, so if there are enough people and there's enough interest, I'll save that for the very end. So quickly, let's talk about who Ahiji is and what our Ahiji does. Ahiji Envision is a remote network management solution. It's a cloud-based solution, which means it's simple and secure, low cost, and very easy to, to install. Um, really what it allows you to do is get a better idea of how your networks are performing, get alerted when there are problems on the network, take different steps to diagnose and resolve those problems through our tool, and make your life easier. Because we'll talk about the trends in networking, how these are going to make your jobs as integrators and network administrators more difficult, uh, and where IHEG fits into that picture. You'll, you'll hopefully know by the end of this webinar. I want to start with some basics. You know, I, I'm sure a lot of you hear the term cloud being thrown around more and more. Hopefully, you're more familiar with what it is. Uh, but I do want to talk about what it is. And the cloud is really just making everything more efficient. It's taking a lot of things we used to do that were very heavy um, and expensive and making them low cost and easy to deploy, very accessible. I think one of the perfect examples of a of cloud-based solution in our industry specifically is if you look at the cost and complexity of doing video on demand services five years ago, seven years ago, it required a something like a Kaleidoscape server where the user would have to invest thousands or tens of thousands of dollars in the system for their home. It was limited to just their home. The content was limited to what they owned. You know, it was very high quality, but it wasn't very convenient. It sure wasn't very uh, cost effective. The cloud has kind of taken that and flipped things upside down with solutions like HBO, streaming, video on demand from Netflix, Amazon Instant, things like that, and taken it to a $99 box that you put in the, the customer's house that all of a sudden sucks down more content than the customer's ever had available. Uh, and does that with very high quality audio video as well. So um, that's kind of an example of the cloud and how it can disrupt things. Really, if you if you kind of steal a term from Dell, um, the benefits of cloud computing is it's making things better, faster, and cheaper. Uh, so we'll talk about some other example cloud services you guys are probably using. Um, Netflix, we just mentioned. Alarm.com is kind of a revolutionary security model. Uh, Spotify, Google Music. Title. I'm sure you're all hearing a lot about Title. Um, Nest, Dropcam, Dropbox, Gmail, Google Docs, Salesforce, Ahiji Envision. The point is, you probably are using a number of these services, and you can see how quickly these services are changing how we interact with devices. So, um, when you're talking to customers, it's, it's really important to be at least educated on what the cloud is and what it means for them. 
and really, as I mentioned before, it's about con convenience and cost. Um, and there are some trade-offs. We'll talk about security later on in this webinar. Uh, but generally speaking, if you choose the right providers, they're, they're very secure as well. Now, I'm going to start by talking about our networks and a very high-level design because this is a basic course. When you look at a network, it's very important to understand that there are a number of components that go into this. And you look at this picture and you see five or six or seven different devices here. But a lot of you are probably familiar with the off-the-shelf box that you get. It's a modem, firewall, router, access point, and switch all in one box. What I want to point out today is that they actually have individual functions. And we need to treat them as individual devices when thinking about what they do. And we'll get into what each one of these pieces of equipment does in a minute. But look at a network and understand its, its high-level design because this is really important to plan uh, properly up front. And when you look at your networks that you're installing today, a lot of times it, it may be an all-in-one router and switch with an access point kind of attached to it for wireless. Uh, but if you're doing typical residential installations, you're doing jobs like this, where it's a very basic installation. But if you look at the, the core of the system, it is the network. And you're installing something like an Apple TV and an iPad for control of that Apple TV and you're installing an IP-based power product to reboot that Apple TV, and you're walking away. The customer may have spent $1,000, $2,000 on this installation. You made a few bucks, but it was on to the next one. It was, it was in and out, really easy installation. And I think one of the things that we're seeing with the trends that I'm going to talk about in, the, in a minute is that we are doing more and more of these jobs, more and more of these really quick, inexpensive, simple installations. But the challenge here is support, and also profitability. If you look at this job and you say, okay, where do I make my money? Your money is all made in your labor. And if you're looking at your warranty policy and it's a one-year labor warranty, it gets a little tricky. Because in the real world, you get the phone call from the customer on Friday night, six months into this installation, and they say, I can't watch Netflix. And then the question is, where do you guys start? Where do you start to troubleshoot this problem? You say to the customer, you know what? I can't figure it out. There's too many moving parts and pieces here. I'm going to have to come out there tomorrow and try to fix it for you. And now you're out there on Saturday on a warranty service call on a job where you made all of your money on labor, and all of a sudden that profit's all gone. So we need to think about ways to do service and support uh, more efficiently. Because if I look at this issue, and I take that scenario, and I say a customer calls and says I can't watch a movie, and I always pose this question to you, where do you start troubleshooting? Sit back and think about this for a minute. Where do I start troubleshooting this simple, simple installation if the customer calls and says the internet's not working or they can't watch the movie? It's actually a very difficult thing to troubleshoot. As simple as it looks, you ask, well, is Netflix working or is, uh, is Pandora streaming? Because you're trying to uncover, well, is it Netflix or is it something else? And oh, well, they say, well, Netflix works and Pand or Netflix doesn't work, Pandora doesn't work. Okay, where do you go next? Well, let's see, can you try pulling the power on the Apple TV and see if that fixes the problem? Maybe the Apple TV fell, Apple TV fell off the network. Ah, uh, yeah, no, that didn't fix it. Okay, well, maybe it's a wireless problem because your Apple TV is wireless. Can you pull out your laptop and see if you can get online? And you can see how difficult this troubleshooting phone call is getting. The customer is probably thinking, what is this guy asking me to do at 10 o'clock on Friday night when I just want to watch my movie? Um, in reality, this could be Wi-Fi. It could be the access point. It could be the router. It could be the switch. It could be the modem. It could be the internet connection. Uh, it's really, really difficult to troubleshoot this problem. It could be user error. We know that users a lot of times pull out the wrong device and access the wrong thing. Maybe it was turning on the theater instead of the living room. Um, now let's look at what your networks more realistically look like. You know, we do high-end integration in homes and businesses, meaning our networks usually look more like this. It's not five or six devices, it's 25 devices. And when I think of that, complexity that I was just talking about, and I applied that to this scenario, where, where in the world do you start when there are this many devices and this many potential breakdowns? Um, my point here is we need to have the proper tools and training to troubleshoot these things effectively, and we can't rely on driving out to the customer site for every single problem. And the other point here is every one of these devices now sits on the IP network, meaning that every one of you are now IT guys, and hopefully that's why you're on this webinar today, because you, you've realized that. And when you look at the trends, and I'm not going to dig very deeply into this, when you look at the trends, this is not changing. It's going to get even more extreme. Today, we've got about 10 billion connected devices on the Internet. In five years, by 2020, we're expected to see 50 billion devices connected to the Internet. If you think about your installations, that's four to five times increase in the number of devices you'll be supporting 
on your job. And when you look at that map and you think about all that complexity and how you're going to troubleshoot and resolve those problems, that's pretty, uh, pretty intimidating. So that's why we're here today, to talk about how we can learn more to, to support those jobs and how we can do it better. And then the other thing that's going to happen that we're going to see really, really quickly is the introduction of gigabit internet services. Now, gigabit internet services are 1,000 times faster than your average broadband connection. It's 1,000 megabits per second stream uh, to the home. That's pretty, that's a lot of bandwidth. When you think about the average uh, is only about 10 megabits per second today, one gigabit per second is a huge increase. What that's going to allow is services like 4K streaming, which require 20 megabits per second minimum compressed bandwidth just to stream a single stream of video. If you talk about multiple streams because the kids are watching a movie on iPads upstairs, you're talking about 100 megabits per second that network has to support just for streaming that video. And we'll talk about why that's important in a second. Um, but I want to first talk about some of the components of the network, and we'll talk about why gigabit matters here. Um, when I go back to that map and I talked about the different things that make up your networks, you notice there are a lot of different devices. And I said none of these devices are, or they all have their individual purposes. Let's first talk about a modem and what it does. A modem is simply demodulating uh, and modulating information between your carrier and your local connection. Usually it's got some sort of signal coming in on something like cable or twisted pair copper, DSL, or even fiber, and it takes that connection and it is converting it into a TCP IP uh, digital signal which your router can then translate. Um, usually it, it's physically translated out through a, an Ethernet cable and then your TCP IP on that local network. So the modem has its purpose. Without the modem, you don't have a bridge to your ISP. You don't have a connection to the internet. All you have is a standalone local network. The next component in the, in the picture is a firewall. And a lot of times your firewalls are integrated into your routers, uh, but understand they do serve a separate purpose. And a lot of times if your customers are looking for a more secure system, you may go out and look for an external firewall because it's better at doing its job. Um, a firewall is really designed to keep people um, from the outside world penetrating your network. So protecting your networks from hackers is its primary responsibility. But as we evolve and as more and more things are cloud-based services, there are packet inspection services and higher-end firewalls that you may want to start to look at. And I mentioned early on in this webinar that I will point you in the direction of further education. Um, we're going to touch on a lot of topics today, and all these things are something you probably want to explore further. We're not going to get deep into any one of them, so uh, I'll just leave it at that. The next device in your network is, is your router, and everybody's familiar with the router. You've got a WAN port, usually, um, and then you've got the four LAN ports coming out of it, and you take those and you put them in your switch, and now you've got yourself a network. A router's function is to route traffic between different networks. Usually that's between a LAN and a WAN from your ISP to your local area network. Um, sometimes you'll have a dual WAN route router, and that's actually a great uh, a sales tool for you guys. If you're selling higher end networking gear, which I'm sure a lot of you are today, you can get a router with two different WAN ports. And what that means is if your primary WAN fails, the secondary would pick up as a failover, so it's a backup. Um, a lot of times you're not spending an additional, uh, or a lot of additional money to upgrade to a dual WAN router. And more often today, the router you're purchasing and installing for your client has dual WAN, you're just not using the secondary WAN. Uh, but I want to make one point is if you go to, especially in the residential world, if you go to AT&T and you say, well, what's your entry level um, DSL service cost? It's like $19.99 or $29.99. Um, and it's, it's, a low, it's a low bandwidth service, but uh, ask your customer what's important to them and they'll tell you internet connections and uninterrupted internet connections is very important. So what you can consider doing is doing a cable modem connection that's you know, 100 megasecond or 80 megasecond for their primary connection and then going to AT&T and getting that low cost uh, DSL connection as the failover. And it only costs your customer additional $30. For a lot of these people um, that you're servicing, the internet is more important than water. It's their life. Um, having the ability to get their emails and do what they need to do and having that fail off, failover is very important. So usually your router has four different ports coming out of it, right? You've got your, your WAN and then you've got four different ports. What those four different ports are is are their switching capabilities. The switch just takes a um, connection and bridges it to more connections. Um, they link segments of the network together so you can expand it. 
well, my router has a four port switch, so I can only put four devices in the network. What do I do if I need to add more physical ports? Well, you add a switch, and then all of a sudden you've got another 24 or 48 ports available to you, and you need more, you add another switch. Uh, so switches really allow you to grow the size of your network. Um, they come in a variety of different flavors. Um, switches come in and manage and unmanaged switches. Uh, manage is something we'll get into in a few minutes is what we recommend. Um, unmanaged switches are, I won't say a dumb device, uh, but it's a very basic switching device. Uh, a managed switch gives you a lot more flexibility for configuration and monitoring. There's also layer two and layer three switches. Um, really for what we're talking about today and most of the installations you're doing, layer two switching is, is more than enough um, for the needs of your residential networks. If you're getting into layer three switches, that's an advanced topic, you'll probably want to leverage manufacturers who are uh, very, very familiar and IT guys who are very familiar with that. So we're gonna leave that topic um, for another time. You may also be installing managed switches with power over ethernet. But what I want you to know is power over ethernet can be done without a managed switch. I'm sure a lot of you have seen power over ethernet injectors that have nothing to do with the switch itself. But for convenience and cost, a lot of switches today have integrated PoE. Um, PoE just injects, injects power over the ethernet cable in tandem with your network traffic. So you don't have to run uh, two different cables. You don't need a 18.2 or uh, you know just power cable running to that device. All you need to do is run a Cat5 or Cat6, and all of a sudden you have power injected over that Ethernet cable, and that access point lights up. And that's great for convenience, cost, installation, cleanliness, and support. Um, it's really helpful. A few points on PoE: certain devices draw more power. Certain switches or all switches have a power rating and a max power output. Make sure you're not overloading your switch. Um, so look at the power rating on that switch. Make sure that the 10 access points you're putting on it uh, don't exceed the power ratings, otherwise you'll have problems. A lot of the things you do in network, and the reason I'm talking about this is proper design and thought up front is really important. And having this education and knowing what to look out for is important. Everybody's doing wireless access points, right? This is nothing new. All a wireless access point does is bridge a connection between the wired device or wired network and the wireless device network. Again, mainly for convenience, your devices don't have to be hardwired. Uh, but we all know wireless is not nearly as reliable as a wired connection. It's also not as fast. The further you move away from that access point, um, the more latency you get into the equation because your signal strength is going down, which means your throughput is, is reduced. Um, so a wire connection is always going to be the faster, more reliable option, but you can't deny the convenience of wireless. So um, most of us are doing wireless connections. There are a number of different uh, technologies out there um, built on 802.11, including A, B, G, G N, and now uh, AC is getting more and more popular um, with the second spec uh, becoming nearly finalized. So uh, AC is the kind of the next generation is going to allow for more um, uh, bandwidth. So gigabit wireless is what we're looking at there. I'm sure a lot of you are seeing wireless controllers out there. Uh, this is also becoming more common, especially with AC, um, because you'll need more access points for coverage. Uh, wireless controllers offer convenience uh, because you do all of your configuration from one controller rather than having to individually do your configuration or access points at each AP. So if you have 12 access points, you don't have to log into 12 different APs. You just log into the controller and it pushes the configs down and manages everything. But a controller also has more intelligence built into it so that things will auto-adjust their, their signal strengths, their channels, um, manage their connected clients, hand over connected clients as they're roaming. So it adds another level of sophistication to your wireless networks. If you're not doing controller-based solutions, it's something I really do recommend. Uh, there are two different options. There are You'll see more and more wireless controllers that are cloud-based. And what that means is you don't have to have a physical um, controller on site, save you cost. Um, the, the challenge with cloud-based is if the internet's down, that cloud-based controller kind of goes away. But a lot of these things have been engineered uh, so that they can work in a failover state while the internet's down, that the access, uh, the wireless access at the local network could still work. So um, you don't have a lot of trade-offs, but know that there are two different options. There's an on-premise for NA cloud-based. Now I'm going to talk quickly about IP-based PDUs and UPSs. Because when you look at all this complexity that, that we've gone through, and you think about the support headaches, having the ability to do IP power management, both on PoE devices and on um, normal AC-powered devices, is really, really important. 
So if you aren't doing IP-based PDUs and UPSs, you should really be investigating these solutions. The great news is they're affordable and they're available from nearly all of your power manufacturers now. Uh, this is something that was reserved for data centers um, you know, three to five years ago. Unless you are a enterprise data center serving servers for Googles and Apples and big, big companies, you didn't really have the budget or access to devices like this. But the beauty of technology is it changes so quickly that now these devices are available for as little as $125 to $150 um, and up to thousands of dollars. But they're available for every single installation for the masses where you can now afford to put these and you should be putting these in your rack. I mean, the question really becomes, can I not afford to put IP PDU products into my installation? So um, if you're not doing this, please take a look at it. Know they come in all different shapes and sizes from vertical rack mount PDUs to just 1U and 2U UPS and PDUs to floor standing and devices you can mount behind your TVs, um, really great products to be looking at. Now, a big question that we get here all the time is what manufacturers, what vendors in the networking world do you recommend? And really, it's about using best in class. It's about picking the manufacturer that best supports your business. It's about getting trained on that manufacturer and trying to stick with it and not, um, not choosing a different manufacturer on a whim because something was out of stock. The challenge with networking equipment is it's all configured very differently. And if you're switching from Cisco to HP to, to Netgear on three jobs in a row, the amount of time and headaches and troubleshooting and, and configuring it is not worth the trade-off because their interfaces and the way they're configured are very different. Um, so pick your manufacturers and stick with them. Think about big name companies uh, that have been doing IT for decades. And, um, and think commercial grade or enterprise grade or better equipment because commercial grade equipment is really what you need as a minimum to be installing in your systems. Um, don't install little consumer grade boxes that you can buy off the shelf at, at you know, big box retailer. That's not what we need. We need to install bulletproof networks in our systems. When you look at how critical it is, it's the digital plumbing. <laughs> I think we've all heard that term of our systems today. Everything revolves around the network. So pick good equipment and convince your customers they need to spend that money because without good networking, everything is ruined, everything's broken. Um, now we have started to put together a reference network and this is just a starting point. It's not, if you're using a device that's not on this list, it doesn't mean that it's not a good device. Uh, but we have a lot of dealers who are asking us, well, what do you guys really recommend? What do you have experience with? And these are some devices we've had either direct personal experience with or We've had our good, reputable, knowledgeable, knowledgeable um, dealers who really understand IT say this is a great product we use in our installation. So um, if you are wondering about what devices to pick and choose, here are some examples. Uh, a lot of these things are ordered in, in, the, uh, in the order of budget and quality. So, uh, you know, the Arachnus and the Luxol switches on, um, on the entry level are a fraction of the cost of what a Cisco 2900 or 3500 series switches, and they're a fraction of the cost for big reason. This is a commercial grade switch. This is an enterprise grade switch. And with it comes a lot more reliability, failover, configuration, flexibility, et cetera. Um, but with it also comes a lot of additional challenges and configuration. So you don't necessarily want to jump into this for every one of your installations in the Cisco 3000 series. Um, you may need an entry, a middle tier and a high end tier or a commercial, a medium business and an enterprise grade option. Uh, when you get into routers, same story, you know, there are inexpensive ones from Microtech, Peplink, Traytech, and there are more expensive ones from Cisco um, and their enterprise line. But you need to have the right tools for the job. So think about the budget and requirements and pick the right equipment. If you are going enterprise and you haven't gone that path before and you don't have somebody who's highly trained and doing enterprise network configuration on a daily basis, I would highly recommend partnering with someone and you can partner with a local IT company or you can partner with one of the companies that has experience in our field. Um, the two in our field that I would recommend are Access Networks and Y Reboot. Uh, and the challenge here, if you're not doing enterprise on a daily basis, the amount of time and headaches you're going to spend trying to get that configuration proper and then troubleshooting isn't worth that extra time and effort. Um, this is something that you need to be doing as a full-time job to really be competent at it. Um, to moonlight in enterprise networking is nearly impossible. So. Um, you know, I think there's a time and a place, and you may get a job that really does require an enterprise network, and that's great. Now go to these guys and partner with them and get a good, solid network and deliver on that. 
Uh, Wi-Fi, two great companies, Ubiquity and Ruckus, are probably the most widely used in our industry. Um, and then there's a lot of requests for two or three outlet power. Um, really what this allows you to do is sequential reboots on your modem and, and router. The Minuteman RPM 1521, um, which was for a time sold by Heiji, uh, but we just now send you straight to distributors. And the Snap AV Wattbox 200 are about the same price point, little two outlet IP power products. You can put them behind TVs, Apple TVs, cable modems, cable boxes, and just a really inexpensive way to reboot. I think the Minuteman cost was about 150. All right, so now getting into network principles. Um, I'm gonna talk about some common terms that you probably have seen, but I really think you need to understand. Number one is a MAC address. What's a MAC address? It's a unique uh, identifier at the hardware level for that Ethernet device. So every Ethernet device has a MAC address. Every MAC address is unique, and it's a layer two um, communication method. So MAC addresses aren't pretty, they're hex, so they're very difficult to remember. 0016241A452F is one you might see on your device. Um, but every one of your, your devices, if you, if you look at your computer, you've got a wireless and an Ethernet and you run IP config, which I'll talk about in a minute, and you look for MAC addresses, you'll notice the wireless card has a different MAC address than the Ethernet card. So every one of those devices has a MAC address. Every device in the TCP IP stack will have a MAC address. The next thing is an IP address. Now, most of you are probably familiar with this. An IP address is, I like to think of it as kind of like a phone number. It's how one device calls and talks to another inf device for information. So. When you go to google.com, you're actually going from your computer's local IP address to Google server's IP address, and those two devices are talking over the IP address. Now, you use a domain name um, for, for user friendliness, <laughs> which we'll talk about in a minute, um, but realize that behind the scenes, those devices are actually talking IP to IP. Um, so it's an internet protocol address, and it's usually numerical. All we're gonna talk about today is IPv4, IPv6 in the home. Really isn't something you need to worry about today. And when it does hit the home and, and the masses, it's going to look more like SIG and Z-Wave where it, it just works behind the scenes and you're not having to administer those IP addresses. Um, <clears throat> so that's what your IP address, uh, there are local IP address spaces. So 192.168, for example, or 10.0.0 or 172. Dot. Um, those are reserved for locals. And then there are WAN IP addresses. Those are reserved for uh, communication across the internet where you actually have to purchase the rights to use that IP address. So that's why you see different types of IP addresses, and that's why 192.168.1.0 is probably the most common on your local networks. The next thing to think about is how do devices communicate with each other from one network to another? Because you, we just talked about local. You've got a local area network of 192.168.1.x, right? And for that device to communicate with Google's servers at 22 something or other, they need to go outside of that local area network. How do they know that? Well, they know that because they use a subnet to define what the address space is locally on the network. And this 255.255.255.0 that you'll most commonly see just says that the local area network that you're on is 192.168.1.1 to 192.168.1.254. There are 254 usable addresses based on this subnet 255.255.255.0. And there's some pretty complex math if you go to Wikipedia and uh, search subnet mask, you'll learn all about how this works. But in this webinar for the basics, all this 255.255.255.0 is saying is that the local area network is 254 usable addresses. In this case, it's 192.168.1.1 to 192.168.1.254. Great, what's that mean? It means that as long as you have the subnet and IP address configured properly and the devices on your local area network, that those devices internally can talk to each other. So if I have a Cloud Escape client and I have a Cloud Escape server and they have a proper IP address and subnet assigned to them and they're on the same network, they can stream local traffic all day long. But what if they need to pull a movie from the internet? Or what if they need to download an update from the internet? And they need to go to a server that's not on that 192.168 space. Well, that's where they rely on a gateway. And the gateway is kind of, it, it's usually a router. Uh, but the gateway is where it will go to get to, to route to another network outside of its local area network space. So if I needed to go to 222.12.13.12 to get my information, and I'm on this 12.168.1.1 network, 
with this subnet, I know, okay, because of that subnet, I know I'm not on this local air network, so I need to go outside of it. Now, who do I talk to to get me outside of my network? I talk to my gateway. And the gateway, yeah, sure enough, well, I can provide you a route and I can get you that device. So it's talking through that gateway to get to the other networks. Um, so gateways for external or outside of that local area network space communication is a requirement. Without a gateway to find, devices can't talk to each other. And the perfect example is Crestron. I'm not picking on Crestron or, or programmers in general, but this is a very common issue. Um, your programmer will set up the, the processor on site, everything's working great, they load the program, they walk away. And then two weeks later, somebody calls and says, hey, I need to make a change on the network or on the, on the program. And the programmer says, great, I can dial in remotely, I'll get that changed. Um, they try to dial in remotely and they can't connect to the processor. They call the IT guy and say, hey, what's wrong with your network? I can't connect to my processor. Um, but we know the client's not complaining. We know it's lo working locally. A lot of times the problem was that whoever set up that, that Crestron processor or AMX processor, whatever it was, didn't set a proper gateway. Meaning that internally on that local network, everything seems to be working fine. You can go to that house and you can load a program. But externally, when it needs to talk to the outside world, it has no way of doing that because it doesn't know its gateway. So. Um, kind of an example of why the gateway is needed, what the subnet does, and how that subnet defines your local address space. Uh, we talked about DNS really quickly early on. DNS is a user-friendly way of accessing information. So instead of going to some obscure IP address, I go to AOL.com, I go to CNN.com. And what DNS does is now it translates that URL into an IP address so the computers can now talk to each other by IP address behind the scenes. Um, so all these devices are actually communicating via IP even though you're, you're typing in google.com. Um, DNS, a tool you can use troubleshoot is NSLOOKUP. It'll tell you what a, if you do an NSLOOKUP from your command line, it'll tell you what uh, www.google.com, what IP address it's, it's resolving to. A lot of times your DNS servers will fail. DNS is designed as a um, designed for failure, actually. So uh, the way it's done is there are top-level DNS servers, and then there are regional DS, DNS servers, and enable local DNS servers. And that's so that you can resolve your names faster because if it's a local server, you can get information a little faster than you would if you had to go to Hong Kong for every single DNS request, for example. Um, so DNS is designed in a, in a hierarchy so that you can have local servers. Now the challenge with a local server is a lot of times it's run by your ISP. And your ISP will take that server and say, we need to do security patches and take that down for maintenance. And this happens more often than you think. Um, so that's fine, though, because DNS was designed for failure. DNS, actually, if you look at your DNS settings, there's a primary and there's a secondary DNS server. Um, and the secondary DNS server is a failover in case the primary doesn't respond so that things can be taken down for maintenance without huge concern. And it's a very lightweight, efficient, low-cost way of doing uh, name resolution. So the point here is always define your secondary DNS server because if the DNS server is down and the customer is trying to get their mail from Google, guess what? In their eyes, the internet's down and your network's down and the wireless is down and it's your fault. But in reality, the ISP took their DNS server down for a short time period and the customer has no name resolution. So if you've set secondary, you're not going to get that phone call um, because it'll gracefully fail over in the background. They'll never know it. Um, when it comes to secondary DNS servers, there are a few that I like to use um, that don't rely on your ISPs um, because, as I mentioned, those can be less reliable. So uh, I like 8.8.8.8, 4.2.2.2, or OpenDNS. Um, I prefer Google's 8.8.8.8 because it's super easy to remember. Um, it's also regionalized and pretty quick and highly available and accessible. Um, so if you're doing configuration, you, know, you can leave your primary from your ISP, but uh, consider specifying a secondary failover and using one of these. Um, DNS also, if you are using one of these, like OpenDNS, you can use it for parental control and phishing protection. They have services you can use. Some are free, some are paid, but a nice value add to that. All right, the next thing I want to talk about really quickly is IP address documentation schemes. Um, we talked about your private IP space. So these are the IP addresses you are allowed to use locally for your networks. If you're using anything outside of these three on the left, then you are not, you're designing a network that's going to fail. Um, and you're designing a network that's going to cause problems. Um, you need to, it's a requirement that you use IP addresses locally in this address space if you want to communicate with the outside world with the internet. Um, so your IPs that you'll typically use in your internal networks look more like 192.168, 192.168.1, 192.168.2, 192.168.3, 192.168.4, 192.168.5, 192.168.6, 192.168.7, 192.168.8, 
10.0.0.something, 172.26 to 172.31.something. That's something. Those are your private IP spaces. What I would highly recommend is you pick a standard. Um, and depending on how you decide to architect your networks, that standard may be the 10 dot or it may be the 192. Um, but pick it and use it at every single job and don't deviate because what you're doing is creating a standard just like you do for all of your other business practices and installations now for your networks. The other thing you should do is consider an IP address documentation scheme. So what that means is that if I'm using 10 dot on my networks, the devices from 10.0.0.1 to 14 are always reserved for routers and switches on the network. And from 15 to 29 are always designed for servers, like video servers. And 30 to 49 are always reserved for control system processors. And 50 to 75 are reserved for touch panels. And 220 to 240 are designed, reserved for access points. And 240 to 245 for printers. You get my point. <laughs> if you look at this, this scheme here, um, you see the IP address reserved for the device, manufacturer, model, and MAC address. Um, what this allows you to do is if you go to the Jones and you need to load a program and you only have one processor, I know exactly where to find it. I'm going to load the process program to 10.0.0.30 and you don't even have to think about it. And then you go to the Smiths and they only have one processor and you need to change the program. Great. I know it's at 10.0.0.30. I'm going to load it up really quickly and easily. Or you're trying to troubleshoot. Same story. Um, what a, you can walk into any installation and have a very good starting point of where the devices are in your networks. And that's really important for network management and scalability. Uh, the other thing you want to make sure you do is document the heck out of these systems. So always fill out a spreadsheet that looks like this. 10.0.0.1 to is the router. It's made by Cisco. It's 1921, and its MAC address is this. Taking the short amount of time it's required to document your networks up front is going to save you so much time and so many headaches in the long run. Uh, make sure it's kept up to date and make sure it's done. This is very, very important. We have a template like this. This is actually our, a template we've designed for you guys to use if you need it. All right, so I'm going to take a, a minute and look over the questions, make sure I've answered all the questions, and then we'll continue on. And this is a lot of information, uh, so as I mentioned, we should have a recording if you want to rewatch this, but um, we have packed a lot of information into this webinar. All right, so I'm scanning through. It looks like I've answered most of the questions um, already, and I, again, I will reserve time at the end of the webinar for questions. So I want to talk quickly about troubleshooting and different uh, tools and tips you can use. Uh, the first troubleshooting tool is ipconfig. If you're using a Mac, which I know a lot more of us are these days, uh, ifconfig is the same command. So what you do is you open up command line, you type in ipconfig slash all, and what it's going to show you on that device is the IP address, gateway, subnet, DHCP information, and MAC address, uh, as well as some other information. But if you want to see what your computer's IP address is, gateway, subnet, MAC address, and DNS servers, run ipconfig slash all or ifconfig it'll spit out that information for you. So it's a great place to troubleshoot. And it's a great place to practically apply what I just taught you. Um, so if you want to take a second and just go to your command line and run that, you'll see what I'm saying. Now, once you have all that information, what are some other tools and tricks you can use for making sure the, inter the network is performing properly? I'm going to take a minute to talk about high-performance networking. And what I love about high-performance networking is we are in an industry that was built on high performance, right? We sell high performance audio video systems. That's what we specialize in. That's what we always have done. So delivering on that performance shouldn't be something new to you. Uh, and I, um, so I want to talk about the things that define a high performing network. A high performing network is judged on generally two different factors, packet loss and latency. Um, you can also say jitter and throughput is part of it, but those all are defined based on packet loss and latency. So packet loss is the amount of information that makes it to where it's supposed to go. So if I am trying to send a power on command to a device and it only receives power O, that means the information, some of that information got lost in that communication and it's not going to work. So packet loss is the amount of information that's lost in the transmission. And on a network, on a good network, packet loss should be 0%. Now there are exceptions if a switch is overloaded if you're doing if you got a bad wireless signal you'll see packet loss the next thing is latency latency is the amount of time it takes information to get where it needs to go so if i was to say on a network send information to another device locally on a hardwired connection on a good network over a hard wire without a lot of without switches being present you're going to get latency that's less than one millisecond almost 
you know, nearly instantaneous is that information going to get to where it needs to go. That's what a high-performing network is. No latency, or is as, as close to zero, because you're always going to have some. So latency is the round-trip time it takes for information to travel from one point to another, and that's measured usually in a round-trip time, and usually you're looking at a round-trip average. And then packet loss and latency should not have a lot of variance. So latency, um, latency should be consistent, mainly. And the consistency of the latency on a network is measured in jitter. If you're doing a lot of VoIP systems, you will notice that term. Um, just keep that in mind if you're doing VoIP. Uh, but jitter is the variance in packet uh, latency. So you shouldn't have one packet that gets there in one millisecond, and the next packet that gets there in 100 milliseconds. That's a lot of jitter, which for the TCP IP protocol is going to cause um, things to slow down. So that's why you don't want to see jitter. Now, those are some terms. That's the definition of those terms. Um, what are some common problems that you're going to see in the network based on that? Um, the number one thing uh, that we talked about already was no gateway set. That means devices can't connect outside of the local net network. I mean, they can't get to the internet. No DNS or no secondary DNS. Well, that's going to mean problematic internet connections. Well, what's high lat network latency mean? That means the customer is going to see the message buffering when they're trying to watch Apple TV. It means their video quality is going to be degraded. It means their audio is choppy. Um, what causes high network latency? A lot of things can cause it, uh, but things you want to think about is when your switches are overloaded, too much traffic is being thrown at that switch. You know, it's a six-year-old switch. You've gone in, you've added a bunch of HD streaming cameras and an NVR, and whenever all those cameras are actively capturing information and streaming to the NVR at the same time, that switch is overloaded. It's got processing capability that's, that's been exceeded. Then it starts slowing down. So once it starts slowing down, what, what happens when it's totally capped? Well, then it stops, starts dropping information, which leads to packet loss. So an overloaded switch can, can be the cause of high network latency and packet loss. A bad switch or a failing switch can do the same thing. Uh, an ISP having issues can uh, indicate bad latency or packet loss. An ISP bad hardwired signal, you know, the cable got cut, and the rain that we had here in Austin corroded the cable last week and all of a sudden that they're getting packet loss and latency and the customer says, my internet's so slow. That's what causes it. Um, and then probably the most common thing that you see in our world and the residential networking world uh, that, that lead to latency and packet loss are bad wireless signals. The further you get away from a wireless device, the lower the signal becomes, the more latency is introduced and ultimately packet loss is introduced. Um, also crowded uh, 2.4 or 5 gig space uh, where there's RF interference can lead to packet loss and latency. So you're going to see higher network latency and higher packet loss in wireless networks, um, generally speaking, compared to your wired. And then SNMP is something that we're not going to get into a lot today, but this is something that you want to start to think about, and we cover more in our intermediate and advanced uh, courses. Now I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about tools to measure latency and packet loss next, and then I'm going to talk about how your packet loss and latency affects bandwidth or throughput capabilities of that network. And I want you to keep one number in mind. Netflix recommends three megabits per second throughput in order to get DVD quality video. So that's 480p, not great quality video, but three megabits per second and five is their published recommendation per stream. So five megabits per second is the recommended HD, three megabits per second is their DVD quality, 1.5 is the minimum. And you're probably looking at these numbers and saying, all right, no problem. My customer's got you know, 20 meg servers and Comcast. I don't have any worries. They've got plenty of throughput available. Uh, and what I want to talk about in a minute after I show you how to measure latency and packet loss is how latency and packet loss impact the, the throughput of your networks. Um, but let's first really quickly talk how you measure pay, latency and packet loss. The number one tool for measuring latency and packet loss is ping. Ping is a very basic command line tool which almost all of your computers have installed. So if you open up command line and run ping and type ping 8.8.8.8, which is Google servers, it's going to start sending information. And what it does is it measures, does that information get to where it's going? Is it, is, it, is it getting lost? And how long did it take that information to get there? So we're measuring packet loss and latency using ping. And if you run it for 10 times, you should see that 10 of 10 packets were sent. Um, and then it will also show you the round trip min, max, and average of that network. So here's an example. I'm pinging a IP address uh, 127.0.0.1, which is actually a loopback, which is like my, you're saying I'm pinging myself. And you see when I ping myself, 
my uh, latency is like 0.1 milliseconds. So super, super fast because I'm doing is pinging my own NIC. Um, but what you should see, especially if you're pinging yourself, is seven packets were sent, seven received, which means there's 0% packet loss, right? Seven out of seven is zero percent. If you see that seven were sent and only two were received, that means we have what, like 80% packet loss, that's bad. Um, and then you'll also see round trip times. You'll see min, average, and max. Minimum was 1.132, average was 0.174, and max was 0.398. So a slight um, deviation but not a lot to be concerned about. Um, this is showing your round trip average, your latency. So that's how you do, that's how you run a ping. Now ping on a local network should look more like one millisecond, because I'm not pinging myself, I'm pinging across a, a hard wire through a switch a lot of times. The more hops or switches or access points you introduce in the picture, the longer it'll take information to get there. Um, the further you go physically, the longer it'll take information to get there. If I was to go ping something in the UK, for example, well, I'm crossing a big pond and it's gonna take longer. It's gonna take a lot longer to get where it needs to go. Um, so distance has an impact on the time. Um, if, you're, if you ping your, your ISP, for example, if you ping 8.8.8 from your ISP on average on your cable modems, you're probably getting between 20 and 30 milliseconds of ping. So on a 20 megabit per second system, 15 megs, you're seeing 20 to 30 milliseconds per ping because you're actually going out over that cable modem signal, which is no longer a 10100 network or a gigabit network, and things are slowing down. So ping, super basic tool, doesn't actually provide you a lot of information, but the information it's providing you is very, very useful. And the next thing I want to talk about is, okay, what does ping uh, measure, or what, is those, what are those measurements actually tell me about my networks? Um, let's look at the impact of latency and packet loss on your 10100 network. We're not talking gig here, we're just going to talk 10100. Now, uh, you'll see this picture down here for a reason, I'm gonna talk about it, but um, on, a, on a network with zero millisecond latency, which is perfect, which is impossible to hit, your TCP throughput with no packet loss is 94 megas per second. So almost exactly what you would expect. There's a little bit of loss because physics involved, um, but there is almost full throughput at zero milliseconds, right? What happens when I introduce 30 milliseconds of latency into that communication. What is my throughput with no packet loss go to? It goes to 16. What happens when I introduce 90 milliseconds to that equation? It goes to five, which is Netflix's minimum HD or recommended HD throughput. So in 90 milliseconds, you're just hitting that. But the challenge is if I'm on a wireless connection, I have a bad signal and I'm trying to stream to an Apple TV and I ping it and I'm getting 200 milliseconds, you're not getting HD video almost guaranteed because you're not getting the throughput required based on that latency. So latency really has a good indication of what quality or what performance that network is delivering. Um, so it's something to really pay attention to if you see latency involved. And another thing I mentioned earlier on, that if you ping 8.8.8.8 from your standard cable modem connection, uh, you'll see 30 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds. If you look at 30 milliseconds, that means you're getting 16 megs throughput theoretical on a good network. Um, which explains your bandwidth, right? Because a lot of you are getting between 10 and 20 megs down from your, your ISP. So it's a really good gauge of your network performance. Um, now let's, let's discard and not think about latency. Let's assume there's no latency in the network. It's theoretically perfect, lightning fast, um, no, no concerns. What happens with packet loss? If I introduce 2% packet loss, we are going from 94 megabits per second throughput to 3.72, which is 2% packet loss. That's a slight amount of packet loss. It's not a lot, but has a huge impact on your networks and your throughput to the point where you're no longer meeting Netflix's recommended standard for streaming. And the challenge with packet loss is you see packet loss and latency on wireless, which is what we're always running our video on. We're running it over the iPad or running it over the Apple TV, and it's, a lot of times it's wireless. Um, if you go to if you introduce latency and packet loss, so let's say we're getting 30 milliseconds of latency and 2% packet loss, your throughput is shot. You're at 1.63 megabits per second. So what you really need to pay attention to in your networks is performance, because you can install Cisco's $15,000 layer three switch, um, and if it's not designed properly, if there's something that's causing interference or things not to perform on that network, if a wire is bad or not terminated properly, 
um, and you're seeing packet loss and latency, it's like putting a, a Ferrari cover over a smart car, right? You're not meeting that performance. So um, those are things to keep in mind. Now, um, I want to talk about some other things. Let's say I am trying to access a service that's really, really slow, and I'm trying to figure out why. Traceroute is a great tool for that. What Traceroute does is measure the latency and packet loss, or sorry, latency of information as it goes across the internet. So if you do a traceroute to cdia.co.uk, it's really kind of cool. You'll see the information go from your router to your local, your regional ISP to your, um, from your, sorry, your local IP, ISP to your regional ISP to a major hub across the country, across the Atlantic Ocean, um, into the UK from London to Cambridge, and you actually see all that information flow using Traceroute. So it's a really uh, geeky tool. Um, like I, I love it, uh, but you'll see the information flow. It's kind of neat. It, it kind of shows you how the internet's wired. Um, so Traceroute is a, co a cool tool for troubleshooting. NSLOOKUP is a great tool, which I talked about earlier. If you do NSLOOKUP, google.com, it'll show you what IP address that your computer's talking to to get to that information. Um, or it'll show you that you've got a bad domain name or your DNS is down. So NSLOOKUP is another good tool. Um, Let's talk about some more practical tools, kind of getting outside of the, the basics on networking and going a little deeper. Um, what if you don't document your networks? What if you walk into a network and you have no idea where anything is on the network? A great tool to find devices and do a, a scan is a, 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 sorry, a network scanner. Um, Ahiji has a network scanner built into its software. I'm sure you guys have used others, which I'll, I'll point out uh, in a minute here. Um, but what a network scanner will do is you can say scan 192.168.1.1 to 192.168.1.254 and show me all the IP addresses and MAC addresses. And then you can try to find that device if you didn't document things properly. And it's really handy if somebody factory resets something that you had set to a, a static IP address and somebody factory reset it and now it's lost in the network. An IP scan is a great way to find it. Um, so an IP scan will look something like this. I do a scan on that range and here's one device and here's its name, here's manufacturer, here's MAC address, and you can use this for troubleshooting support. It's a great tool. Um, like I said, Ahiji has one built in. There are also some others you can use uh, if you don't have Ahiji on site. Um, another great tool is a speed test because we talked about streaming services and their bandwidth requirements. And if a customer is trying to watch Netflix and the ISP is not giving them that five mil megabits per second minimum, well, they're having problems. The way you can see if it's the ISP or your local network, uh, you can run a ping locally to check latency and packet loss, and if everything looks good on your local network, then you run a speed test. You see, okay, what's my ISP doing? What's it giving me? And what you should see is, well, my ISP is giving me 40 megabits per second and 10 megabits per, uh, down and 10 megabits per second up, so that is good. The latency on the network is four milliseconds, which is super low because I have a quality fiber connection coming to that. Um, so I hate you have a speed test built in as well. And the nice thing is it runs behind the scenes. It's gonna run four times a day and it's gonna plot it out what it's done. Um, and show your averages. Or you can also always go to like speedtest.net or speed of me and do a speed test. You can load this up on your cell phone too, which is really great. Uh, additional tools, um, the speed test app is awesome. Put it in your phone, show it to your customers, say, hey, this is why we need a better router because you can see you're paying for um, 300 meg service, but your router tops out at 100 megs. And if I do a speed test, I'm only doing 100, which means you're getting a third of what you're paying for. Time to update your router. Or it's time to update your wireless network. Uh, Fing is a, is a super cool tool, it's a free tool. Um, it's basically an IP scanner app for your phone. So you can load up Fing, do a scan, and see all the devices in your local network. Um, I have Angry IP Scanner is another one. What is my IP.org is another tool that I like that'll show you like what your WAN IP address is for troubleshooting and support. So some really good troubleshooting tools. Oh, a uh, uh, side note, let's go back real quick. Um, if you are supporting your customers and talking to them about the importance of the network, Go to your customer site, run a thing, and show them. So first, ask them, how many devices do you think on, you have in your network? And they'll probably say, I don't know, five or six. Run thing, and I guarantee you're going to come up like 10 or 12. And they'll, actually, there's double that. And then you can talk to them about the importance of a good network and why all this is important and why they're paying you more because you're an IT guy now. All right, so last topic um, before we kind of summarize everything and wrap up. Uh, methods of remote access. And as you probably noticed, Doing all this on site is going to become very, very difficult and time consuming and, and just isn't worth it. It's expensive. A lot of this can be done remotely and there are a number of ways to do remote access. 
there's port forwarding, there are cloud-based services, there are VPNs, SSH, remote access, and Ahiji's got a great remote access tool called Connect Ninja. So I'm gonna quickly talk through each one of these. Um, the first one, port forwarding, is not secure. Stop port forwarding for remote access. It is, everything you read about, and generally um, speaking, is uh, with, with home automation hacking, is due to two things. It's due, due to bad firmware where there's a security flaw on that device, or because somebody port forwarded, or it's a combination of the two. If you've got a device that's behind a router and a firewall, um, and it's not port forwarded, but it has a bad software load that's vulnerable to hackers, if the hackers can't reach it, if it's not port forwarded, your customer's a lot safer. If it's port forwarded and there's a known flaw, your customer is at risk. So go back to all of your sites and stop port forwarding. I literally carve out some time every single week to go back and evaluate all your customers' networks for security, and you can even run a security service for them and say for $99, we'll come out and do a security assessment and take that time and stop port forwarding. Look at other ways of doing it. Uh, port forwarding is, it's not sophisticated hackers we're talking about. We're talking about kids in middle school that are running these exploits because mainly port forwarding is open. So stop port forwarding. Um, a better way to do it is Ihiji's Connect Ninja. It's essentially giving you the same access to your devices without port forwarding. And the beauty here is it's not wide open. It's only open to people who have logins to Envision. And it's as easy, if not easier than port forwarding. So Ahiji has a Connect Ninja solution, um, which will kind of eliminate the need for port forwarding. If you're using VPN, VPN is a, it's a great tool. Um, it's very powerful. It's available in your higher end routers, but it requires more configuration and a lot more complexity on that side to support it ongoing. And it also requires better username and password management because you don't want to share your VPN credentials with every single employee, because that means every single employee has access to all of your networks. And if they ever leave, they still have access. So uh, VPN, I would recommend using only um, as like a tier three support and no, don't share your credentials with anybody outside of your IT ad admin. That support ticket should have to be escalated to the top so that not all of your technicians have your VPN credentials. Um, the Connect Ninja is a much better way of giving your technicians access because you can just turn them off if they ever leave. I'll really quickly talk about some of the challenges that you guys might face. You know, I've talked about a lot of different tools and each of your manufacturers have a different set of tools. And we look at remote network, uh, remote management in general, you know, having a dozen tools and having to figure out where to start is a headache because a lot of times it's more comfortable and a little easier for the technician to just say, hey, I'm gonna jump in my car and drive out there. But that model doesn't work with this much complexity. It's a, it's a time loss, it's a money suck, it's a money drain. It's not good for customer service, they're having to wait for you. Um, so when you're looking at this, one way you can do this, and one of Ihiji's main benefits, just for a quick plug, um, we really do break down these silos. We try to give you one place to access as much information as possible. So your tier one, tier two, even your tier three troubleshooting and support can be done from a single portal, meaning you don't have to think about where to start. Um, it also means your technicians will have to be trained on one tool. Um, that's one of our biggest benefits is we work across manufacturers to allow for that. Um, so quickly, some other things you want to consider, network management and monitoring. You know, all these things can be actively monitored so that you can log their performance history. So you can say, well, this only happens like once a week at 2 a.m. and it's probably just the ISP. And this DNS server went down once last month, but it was probably, it was three in the morning, so it was probably planned maintenance because it was back up an hour later. Um, those are the types of things you want to look at. Um, so managing and, and monitoring this information actively is important. You can also set up alerting so that if the ISP has latency that's 100 milliseconds, you guys get notified so you can call your customers and say, hey, you know, you may have slow internet connection. Um, we're looking into why. So it's a much cleaner customer service support story. Uh, the other thing you want to think about is remote power management. You know, having the ability to remotely, uh, remotely reboot things is really important. So you can do that through IP PDUs. You can also do it through PoE switches, which I think was one of the things we didn't talk about earlier. But one of the other benefits of a managed um, PoE switch is that you can individually power cycle ports. And more and more of our devices are PoE powered, cameras, touch panels, um, even control processors. If you have the ability to just say power cycle that control processor and says, well, I knew that ports, uh, that that, that control process is on port four, so I'm just gonna turn the power off to that port and turn it back on. You've kind of blue bolt enabled to steal an industry term, that switch, and it's really handy and convenient. With an Envision, you can do cloud-based reboots. Again, don't do port forwarding for that. That's a bad idea. Uh, there are cloud-based solutions for that. Um, really quickly on remote access, I talked about the Connect Ninja. Any, any IP device, any single TCP port can be connected to. 
it auto to connects to it, um, which is a really nice thing. So a couple of examples of things that you may want to do remotely and troubleshoot remotely um, are switches. I want to access my switch and change the SNMP information or change the VLAN assignment on port four or look at the performance and see if there are any uh, packet loss or, or errors or drops on a certain port so I can see what port is causing problems. You can do all that really easy through Connect Ninja. Um, another one is setting up IP uh, power reboots. So the internet goes down, I want to reboot one and then two outlet. So cable modem or router sequentially, you can manage that through the Connect Ninja. Um, this is an example of the Minuteman one of how you do that. Really simple. Um, remote support, you can get all the way down to a screen share with your customers. And you can say, okay, I need to take control of your desktop to fix this problem. So a lot of flexibility, and, um, no matter what remote control tool you're using, um, you have a lot of power and flexibility. <clears throat> so to kind of summarize, what are some tips that you guys need to, to think about um, as integrators? The first thing is always use managed switches because a managed switch can be pinged. You can measure latency and packet loss. Switches fail. If that switch fails, I want to know and I want to be alerted on it. You can do that if it's a managed switch. Put all IP devices on your network. Use IP-based power management. Think about the sequential reboots. Um, think about wireless management. If you're not using controllers, there are virtual SSIDs you can set. Um, if you're doing devices like Blu-ray players or Apple TVs and you are managing or controlling those over IP, uh, think about energy star savings because those that little setting turns off the IP port or Ethernet port when the device goes into power standby. Plan now for the future, and my best advice for that is conduit. Run conduit from your DMARC point to your, your main closet run conduit from your closet to your main locations and your other equipment closets. That way you don't think you don't think about, well, do I need CAT6, do I need fiber, what's gonna come that I don't even know about. Um, and lastly, you can think about using a remote PC for programming at your remote jobs. I think that's really handy. Other best practices on your routers, um, always block WAN ping requests that limit your exposure to hackers. Limit remote management from the WAN side, that's an option in most routers, and I would highly recommend doing that. Change your default usernames and passwords on every single device. Um, pretty pretty straightforward. Use DNS server backups, we already talked about. Dyn DNS is something that I'm sure most of you are doing, but uh, it's a really handy service and really low cost, dynedns.org. Internally in your networks, you want to standardize your IP scheme. And I have that the template that I talked to you about available if you want it. Um, standardize your GHCP server ranges, so within that IP scheme that, ex that exists. Uh, if a device is important enough, for you to troubleshoot and support it remotely, it should have a permanent home on the network. So I'll say that again, if the device is important enough for you guys to try to troubleshoot at some point or another, it should have a permanent home, meaning it should be set to a static IP address or used DHCP, DHCP MAC address reservation to do that. Because if that device fails, I wanna know exactly where to find it to see how it's behaving. Um, so that's an IT best practice. Don't use DHCP for every single device in your network. That's not a best practice. Um, and enable SNMP. And lastly, I'll, I'd said this before, document, document, and document some more. So where can you guys go for additional training? Um, this is our Network Essentials series. Uh, this is the basic course. Um, we also have an intermediate advanced. So if you'd like that, we have those on demand, and we do them about once a month. Wikipedia is a great source um, of information. If you want to learn more about subnet masks, go to Wikipedia. You'll learn a ton. Uh, leverage industry partners such as Access Networks and Y Reboot. They can teach you a lot. And there will be a time when you probably will need their services, but it may not be something you need to do for every single job. Talk to them, learn more about what they provide, learn more about what good networking equipment is. You can also think about partnering with your local IT guys. They could be a great source of referrals. Um, leverage your manufacturers that you're buying from. Those, if you standardize on Cisco and, and Luxol, Go to those guys and get fully trained in their product line. And again, stick with your product. Don't change manufacturers unless you absolutely have to. So um, learn that product in and out. Uh, to plug Cedia, Cedia's got now great online content for network training, so you don't have to send all of your text to, to Cedia Expo just to get trained. A lot of that content's now available on demand. It's a great member benefit. Um, every single one of your technicians should be competent on networking. So use courses like this, use Cedia courses. Um, CompTIA is the, kind of like the CD of the IT world, they also do training. And then consider the CD Residential Networking Specialist uh, accreditation. Um, this is something that CD put together that I helped with about two years ago. It provides a great learning track for your techs. If you really want to get some of your key engineers and get them uh, very competent in networking, this is the way to go. It defines a nice path for them to, do, to take through the, the process. Our content at CD is always being refined and, and, and added and kept up to date based on 
technology of feedback. Um, so these are great courses. The people who put time and effort into this really care about them. Um, so take advantage of those courses. Uh, they're they're super valuable. And then I want to I want to summarize by talking about you know you spent you invested time and money in this today, right? You're sitting here during time when you could be out selling things um, or out servicing something and getting paid for it. You guys are investing a lot of time and money in becoming IT guys. You guys are going to be IT guys. So this is your opportunity to monetize this knowledge because this is a business. We need to make money off of our services and knowledge. Um, so there's a few different things to think about. Number one, your service model, rolling a truck for every single service call in a, in a 25 device a network setup like we talked about early on, just to reboot something is not efficient, it's not professional service, it's not proactive, and it's not profitable. So stop relying on it. Use more remote tools to do things. Get trained and do things remotely. That's the first thing. When you do that, though, don't do it for free. Get paid. So if you're going to do a virtual truck roll and reboot something, charge the customer for it. They're saving money and you're doing things immediately. Another way to do it is look at the way the IT industry did it and generate a recurring revenue stream. And I'm not going to get into a lot of detail because we've got full one-hour webinars on this, but I want to tease you on how you can do this. You can simply monetize all this knowledge we talked about today with a simple managed service offering, which provides recurring revenue business tomorrow. You start doing this with every one of your networks. And you say for between $5 and $50 a month, we're going to do remote network management, so we'll do configuration changes remotely. We'll measure your performance on your network, both, both on the LAN and WAN, so speed test and localized or local uh, latency. We'll do Wi-Fi monitoring and make sure all your Wi-Fi is functioning properly. We'll reboot things remotely for free if it's capable. And we'll also try to do as much uh, remotely as far as dialing and making changes uh, without a truck roll cost. So that's a managed service offering. This has a lot of value to you and your customers. They're willing to pay for this. So what you can do is make the service offering a standard with every one of your routers. And now for every one of my routers, I'm getting between five and $50 a month recurring revenue. The first tier, I get um, just ISP performance. You're doing a speed test for your customers. You're saying, look, you're paying $80 a month for your internet. For $5 a month, we can monitor that internet, not only tell you when it's down, but also tell you what the performance is, how fast it's going, and is it meeting your, your needs. Now, for only $20 a month, we can also monitor all of your local devices, and I can do remote reboots for you. Um, and I can tell you if your Wi-Fi network's having problems. If it's a bigger network, you know, it's going to cost you a little more. It's going to be only $30 a month. And if you're doing a larger network and you've got like 50 devices on the network, it's only $50 a month. Um, the point is, this is a requirement on a, on a network with 50 devices. And the cost, the price point on this is something that the customer should be able to tolerate. At that point, they're paying $100 a month for their internet. They're paying $200 a month for their premium cable package. $50 a month to them doesn't mean much. So um, this is a really easy way to do it. I'm going to leave it at that. Let's say if you do want to learn more, email us, and we have the recurring uh, revenue webinars on you on this. Um, so in summary, what can you guys do next? First thing you want to do is standardize and document. Second thing you want to do is continue learning because there's a lot more to learn. Um, think about implementing a monitoring or remote management solution. Standardize your networks. Create best practices for all of your installations so that everything looks similar. Educate your technicians, anybody who touches your networks, which is anybody who touches your Sonos and Apple TVs, should know what an IP address, a gateway, and a subnet mask do. They should understand what each one of those things does. Um, reinvent your business as we're becoming more IT-centric, as we're relying less on moving boxes, more on our services. Reinvent your business to ensure long-term success. And that recurring revenue, I believe, is a big part of it. And we're here to help you do it um, through all of our education. Uh, with that, I will say thank you to everybody. I appreciate your time today. Um, if you have any feedback, please share it with me. Here's my contact information. If you would like a demo, um, please remember to go to ihedu.com and schedule a demo there. Again, we'll do it at your own convenience. It's not like they're scheduled. So you say, I need one at on 1 o'clock tomorrow. We can do that for you generally. So uh, give us a call. Send us an email. Um, thanks again, and have a great day.